Hey, buddy. Hi. How you doing? I'm great. How are you? Good. Good. Closing in on my final days in Japan, actually. Yes. About to go back to Europe. Yeah, it's kind of sad we waited this long to start doing this. Yeah, exactly. We had to be quarantined to kind of get our get, get our act together, get our shit together. Yeah. yeah. I will say, I'm wearing my Mad Max jumper today. You are. So this inspiring. is inspiring. Yeah, this is our editorial crew jumper. That's so amazing. We made this once we finished the film. That's so. really cool. Yeah, that's really cool. We actually do um, back in the days when I started at Sony Ericsson. We made our crew telephones. Oh, really? So we made custom telephones based, of course, on the design um, of the the telephone that we just launched, and everybody in the crew got like a like a custom phone. That's pretty epic. Yeah, I was just a, I was a young kid, so when they gave me the opportunity to design my first of uh, overall, they gave me the opportunity to design a phone like officially and then i got to go crazy with the crew crew stuff wow yeah that's pretty cool do you still have them um i do i do i i actually only got to do a couple because then when we became sony and everything else um yeah there were some changes in the rules but Mm. yeah well speaking of phones and speaking of you designing stuff Uh today's all about you it is Let's uh, let's talk about how you ended up being a designer at Sony. Um, yeah, for sure. All right. Well, it started in in Sweden back in the days, and uh, I think uh, I've always been very interested in creating stuff uh, on different levels. But it's just been a really big integrated part of my life. And um, when I found out that you can actually do this for a living. That was like a dream come true. Actually, a modern analogy that I like to do is I remember being being much younger than I am today and reading some books that were all about, like, actually, Harry Potter is a good example. So if you read Harry Potter, you have these wizards at this imaginary place going to wizardry school. And it seems like so amazing that there's such a thing as wizardry school and that you're allowed to do that for a, for a living, so to speak. And then I realized that's actually what I'm doing. I'm going to wizardry school, that's design school. And then I actually get out in the world and be able to do this for a living. It's rather amazing. That's pretty cool. Yeah. People are going to think you're insane, though. I mean, well, <laughs> you have to be yeah. to be doing what we're doing, I guess. All right. So yeah. let's, let's take it back to the beginning. Of course. All right. How did you start down the design path? Yeah, well, so uh, since it's always been kind of an integrated part of my life and my, my dad's a um, graphic designer and a musician and my mom has always been very creative. She, at the moment, she's uh, weaving and she's also doing her own jewelry from old old tires, like bicycle tires and stuff. Well, she's creative. I'm not, maybe, maybe yeah. Yeah, maybe not for everybody, but she, she I mean, runs a wizarding school. It's fine. Did, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. No, so I think I think I was always allowed to explore that side. It wasn't frowned upon at all. So that creative side was always like encouraged. Um, I never really think that my my parents sat down and kind of teach me the craft. Although my dad's a designer, he never sat me down and be like, "This is how you design stuff." It was rather that I was in an environment that was highly influenced by culture and um, I was allowed to express myself and and encouraged to do so so I think that really propelled me into a world where 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 I could imagine myself being being a designer yeah I think that has a huge impact on people is if they're in a nurturing environment to be creative yeah no, I think so as well, and also exposure, right? So I remember being a, being a teenager, young young teenager, and uh, my aunt, me and my brother went to Beijing in the 90s, and that was a quite different Beijing to what it is today. But I remember just being exposed to different parts of the world also opened up, like, ex- again, exposure, open, open up the fact that this actually exists and these are places that you can go to. And, and then you can start to dream about like living in Tokyo, for instance. Yeah, man, you're pretty lucky. I am. I am. So are you. Yeah. <laughs> so your parents were very nurturing. You, yeah. you got, you had a good creative environment. When did you start thinking after that? Or when did you start preparing to go into design? 
It's a it's a good question because I remember the well. So we had a computer with design software at my house because my dad's boss at the time thought it was a great tool for him to be able to have access to in case he needed to do work from home as we're doing now. He was like foreseeing this event. He knew this was yeah, coming. Yeah, and this is this is not like a small neat thing like like we're we're having on the table right here. That was like a major big machine, um, and it actually was used more. For for my pleasure than than what it was actually supposed to be like there was very little serious work done on that machine. I remember yeah. my, my dad working there a few times when he had like the flu or something ironically, but but in the end I I ended up using this machine to play video games. That's actually how I learned English, but also to play play around with the design software designing my own invitation cards for for my birthday party that's in cool. uh, aldous page maker back in the day so yeah so that was really so that's basically um, i got a little bit familiar with like the tools mm. um already at the but I, I didn't really understand what i could use them for and then i made a mixtape to my um, to my uh, um to my teacher in eighth grade and uh, I ended up spending much more time um, designing the cover of the mixtape than anything else. And that was a calling. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, that was, that was kind of the way how I got exposed to it and how I really got the passion for it. Cool. So yeah. it was kind of at the eighth grade, like mid high school? So yeah, so I school? guess I was around 15. Yeah. yeah, 15 years old. Also, like we had this huge... Um, huge like end of the year kind of project in school so the entire school year was around the second world war and i remember me and my friend we wrote a big essay around auschwitz but we spent all of our free time um that we had um to build a full-scale model of Auschwitz for the exhibition that we were going to have. Wow. So it was always like a very integrated part. Like if I could find a way to express what I wanted to say in a different way, I always embraced that and I loved it. And I was willing to spend a tremendous amount of time uh, of my free time to do it mm -hmm. as well. So I think that was like the, the key, the instigator, so to speak. So then transitioning from high school where you're just sort of doing your own thing and learning yeah. software to yeah. have, to going, I guess you went to university to... Yeah, so basically I actually went to design senior high school. So I went three years in design school already at a high school level. Oh, wow. So from the age of 16 to, um, to 16, 18, I guess. Yeah, around 18, 18, 19. Um, so I got to study photography, filmmaking, um, actually radio production during the first year. So the first year you dip your toe in all kinds of different fields and then you get to choose your major. So I majored in graphical design and I took extra courses in photography and uh, 3D, 3D, 3D design. Okay, so yeah. how does a guy that's doing photography and, <laughs> and graphic design end up designing phones and things for Sony? It's a good question. So basically, um, during university, where I studied both graphical design and product industrial design, um, I, I actually got to work for a design studio in Sweden um, during my, my free time. But just, just, I just embraced everything that was all around me. So, um, and by doing so, uh, I got an opportunity um, to, to do some research after school as well so i found a website where they were actually looking for someone with a similar background to mine it was very ambivalent and it didn't really state what it was all about but they said that they needed someone with great graphical design skills but that had knowledge within product design and i was like this is this is me like, this is it yeah this is it <laughs> so but it didn't state like for a major for a major company mm. but it was very very vague what it was all about and it was uh, as a role as a consultant at the major company and I was going to be hired by this design studio. And um, I applied 
um, I collected all my works and, and sent it in. And actually, by chance, somebody walked past a computer where, where my portfolio was being displayed. And they kind of already dismissed me because it got wrong in the wrong hands. Didn't really know what I was applying for. And then the guy that was actually looking for this position walked past, saw my stuff. It's like, he, this guy is perfect for, for what I'm looking for. That's and, yeah. amazing. Lucky, but amazing. Lucky, well, also, yeah, opportunistic. I was there. It, yeah. The stuff were there. I had a portfolio that I could send in. I had the works. Well, that that's a big thing, isn't it? Yeah. That it was lucky that he saw it. But how many hours would you have put into building an incredible portfolio that, that somebody walks past and sees and grabs their attention? Yeah, no, for sure. And how much of the work that I've put in since since I was basically born, actually feeds into everything I do. And I mean, the exposure to all the movies that my, sometimes my dad forced me through. I mean, he was like, we're gonna watch this movie. And I didn't really know, like Blade Runner, when I was far too young to actually know what it's all, all about. But he actually took the time to explain why this is amazing. And, uh, and also Star Wars, I remember, that's my actually my first uh, VHS kind of experience. He borrowed a VHS from a neighbor and we got to watch Star Wars and wow. just me building my own chips later and everything else. So I think it all feeds in, but you, of course you need to work on it. And, and to the point where you can be lucky, it, it, expose, ex, it exposes all the work that you've been putting in so far to get to that point. And it's yeah. like, put you on the line and say like, all right, do you have what it takes? Yeah. Yeah, so basically, yeah. So I got after a l huge long line of interviews and everything else, I actually got a call and uh, I got employed by Sony Ericsson at the time that actually happened to have their main office just 20 minutes away from my house. Oh, perfect. Perfect at the time as well, because Sony Ericsson and Apple, I would say, were the, the two, as an industrial designer, or they were the two strongholds. They were really Sony, of course, as well. But I mean, the, this is the, at the pinnacle of cell phone design and everybody wanted a cell phone and everything else. So that was that was rather amazing to be able to work with, with someone. And for a company that was so well known worldwide and that were actually located so close to where I grew up. Wow. Yeah. So then to go from there, how did you end up traveling overseas? Well, I always had that dream of working overseas. I've been exposed to people working overseas in the past. Um, one of my dad's childhood friends also actually works with building um like what do you call it like star like you're looking at star like a telescope, telescope. yeah yeah on mountains all around the world he's wow. been to chile he's been to so we actually visited him in the canary islands where he built a telescope on, on top of a mountain and, and helped running that and everything else so i got exposed to that that was actually a possibility that you could work so he's always been there and um yeah, so after I became a senior designer back in 2012, a part of that uh, transition was actually, I did some really good good work, apparently, I won some prizes, and I was on the... Uh, apparently, uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> somebody I mean, liked some, it, I guess. Somebody liked yeah. it. Somebody liked it and awarded me some, some, some prizes. And, and, and that was enough to get you know, the attention from the mothership, from Sony. And they were like, all right, why don't you come over to Japan? And at this time, the, the, the main office for the mobile division was still in Sweden. And we had a really good team um, of designers that did what I do. And they were like, why don't you come over and show us like a little bit how you do stuff back in Europe? And maybe we can learn something and you can pick something up from here as well. So that was in 2012 when I got to Japan the first time. Wow. Yeah. And then just, you know, always being available, always being hungry when I was here the first time. Um, people noticed me, noticed some of the work that I'd done. And then when the opportunity to start a design office in Taipei, when that opportunity revealed itself, um, I pitched a little bit for it as well, but, but I, was, I, was the, I was the main candidate to go over and, and make sure that uh, we could have a design office in, in Taiwan. Wow. So that was an amazing experience, yeah. So then... You went to Taiwan, yeah, but you're no longer in Taiwan. I'm no longer in Taiwan. So what happened there? So I was basically doing, um, I was d 
doing design in Taiwan, we were a really small team and um, we were around five five designers there and and uh, I was I was very involved in in the production and and, and very close to both the the local engineering and, and planning team but also the external so we worked a lot with external uh, external companies to help us manufacture the products and uh, unfortunately um, at the time um, Sony wanted to bring things closer back home, uh, limit how many how many design offices they, they had. So they were like, all right, we want to bring some of these functions back to Tokyo. But because I was so invested in uh, in the work that I've done up up to that point, they really saw it as a as a big opportunity for me again, similar to the first time I came to Tokyo to come to Tokyo and bring all that knowledge with me and and um, implement that uh, here. And is there a difference in design in Taiwan and Japan? There's 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 huge differences all over the world, I would say. But I think design in itself, um, I wouldn't say that aesthetics or anything else is the major difference. I think it's more about people mm. and how you... Because a big part of what I do, especially in Taiwan, but also here, it's all about managing people and people's expectation and communication and and uh, and so forth and uh, you need to speak to people differently and you can expect different results depending on how you how you treat the situation mm. and how you guide them through different things and some some parts of the world you needs to be more hands on and and others you can you have to motivate them differently so i think that's the major 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 difference a lot of cultural aspects to it yeah 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 for sure and and you need to not a, you need to speak their language but not necessarily only like in linguistically i mean mm. it's more of a cultural kind of understanding where they're coming from what drives them and and that comes with experience, but also you you need to develop a good skill of being able to listen and observe what's actually going around, uh, going on around you. Yeah. So when did you come back to Japan? Back to Taiwan uh, to to, uh, to, Tokyo. to Tokyo after Taipei was two thousand and sixteen. Okay. Yeah. So I've been here for this time around four years. Yeah. So it's been great. It's been great. Um, started off my first years here. I, I continued to work on what I what I worked on in Taiwan, and then uh, I got the opportunity to work with uh, more local projects. So I had designed a a, a phone that was um, Japan exclusive, so only released here in Japan for Japanese high school students, girls that is as well, which was ironic because I'm the I'm the only foreigner who designed products in Japan. And I got the opportunity to design products for for Japanese high school, high school girls, but it went really well and I'm really happy. And because that went so well, and I got to work throughout the entire design, design cycle. So I actually designed um, also, yeah. So I designed the, the parts of the UI interface as well. So it was like a full circle. I was part of, um, creating the marketing material and so forth. So <clears throat> if you're working on a flagship product, you have the, all the eyes on you from the from the company. It's worldwide. You have so many different people. It needs to align with. But this, this particular product was much more, uh, it was like a product by itself. It was released only in Japan. And we were allowed to create a story that was um, um, much more, I wouldn't call it unique, but it's much more particular. Mm much more uh, um, to high school girls to high school girls <laughs> but it wasn't girly at all actually it was a very interesting co- concept um, I developed a concept called Mirage so it was all about like like having very soft shapes but also like shifting shifting uh, treatments of the um, of the of the of the of the materials that we use and the same uh, the the wallpapers the wallpaper design like took some of the narrative that we created around the story and brought that to life through the ui as well so yeah actually some photos that i shot got got implemented and used that's pretty cool yeah that's pretty cool so in doing all that yeah i mean that was a pretty big opportunity for you i'm guessing um and we've sort of like talked about this a little bit before you know there's Mm. a certain amount of luck as well but all the amount of time you've spent over your career preparing and getting ready for something like this when it comes up to be able to nail that yeah how 
how much like how ready were you for this this opportunity um which particular opportunity the the, the Mirage, japanese yeah, yeah. yeah no no that everything that i've done has led up to this like all my work also within graphical design i mean i used to work uh, at a graphical design studio um, during my studies as well and and all of this like pays off like and also my interest in photography and i had like hours and hours and hours of of working photography that all when it like once again it all came to a point where i got like a almost like a dream project like this is this is a very real project this is going out but also it's a little bit out of the way of our normal narrative so you're free to go i wouldn't call it bananas but you're free to really create a unique story by like by itself and and by by having all the different knowledge within graphical design within photography and nibbled in you know marketing and all of that before I had the tool sets and I had the knowledge to actually to run with it mm. when when I was given the opportunity, and then deliver the product on time. Yeah, 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 and budget. also yeah, of course, and you know my knowledge within when it comes to project management and, and dealing with people and everything else, like everything, like I think that's the. It's hard to it's hard to articulate your full skill set, but it, it's when you're giving opportunities like this, that's when it actually that's when you can show the, the full capabilities of and everything that that you've learned up to the point mm. but it's a yeah. lot of time getting to that point it is but it's also it's also so hidden in a way because yeah. you've been working on it like you've been honing these skills for for so many different years and you you pick on up there's references everywhere i mean there's references in my design to 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 a lot of like to a lot of music to, that my dad exposed me to and also m- movies he exposed me to growing up. And it's quite funny because, of course, I'm really thankful to, to have the parents that I have and they've been amazing and so supportive, but they they weren't very hands-on parents at all. Like, I mean, of course, they ta- taught me a lot of things, but I, I never remember like them sitting next to me and showing me the ropes. Mm. And... Um, but yet there's so much references to them and my upbringing and, and everything else that I've been exposed to in all my designs, in all my photography, um, because it's something that I bring with me and it's a part of the story and the narrative. Hmm. And a part of you. It is. And I'm, 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 not, I'm not afraid of allowing that to, to, um, to be exposed in everything I do as well. And I think, I don't know, I mean, sometimes it's so important with, you know, the vision. I've, I'm, I can be really difficult to be around sometimes because I have such a strong opinion on how I want things. I, I don't impose it or push it on, on upon others necessarily, but um, by by knowing what I want, sometimes you don't necessarily know how to get there, mm. but that's how you develop your skills because you know what you want, you know what you're aiming for, and you know that something is off, so you keep on working on it until you can get there. Well, I think in general as well, if you have a, like, I think you need a goal. If you're yeah. going to do a project like learning photography or, you know, learning design, it definitely helps if you have a goal at the end Yeah, uh, and it, it sort of directs you. Otherwise, I've had ideas where I tried to learn various software or something and it's just like, all right, now we can learn visual effects software. Or it's like, oh, where do I start? Everything's available. Where if you sort of narrow it down and have that goal to to head towards, it doesn't matter if you veer off the path, you can always redirect yourself. Yeah. No, I completely agree. And I mean, language is a perfect example for that. It's really hard to learn a language isolated and, and not exposed to it. But but yeah, in a similar way, if you're having a goal and also if you're having a strong, really strong passion about something, the work doesn't really seem like work. Yeah. Um, we're both fortunate enough to to actually be able to to work with things that we adore and that we love and that we might even have would be doing even if I mean we're doing this right now and nobody's paying us but but again the Yet. things that, <laughs> but again I mean who knows I mean further down the line maybe maybe I'll end up in a in a in a position where where all all the things that we learn right now really make it worth it mm-hmm. as well and I think that's something that I really picked up on. It's like if you're passionate about it and if it gives you something, even if it's just a little bit or for your own pleasure, um, sometimes it wor- it's worth exploring. And, yeah. and you can 
be in a position later on where you might need to extract those skills that you seemingly um, spent in vain yeah. when you were a teenager. And then all of a sudden you're like, ah, now I can dig up those, those miniature painting skills. <laughs> so back to, back to you. Yeah. After you did that project, mm-hmm. um, was that a big turning point for you? I think in terms of uh, exposure and, and, and also what I like to do, I think, mm-hmm. I think it's a, uh, um, I think it's the narrative of my career changes a little bit. Um, I think when I was working in Taiwan, it was much more like a project project manager, even though I was a designer. What really stood out, I mean, I was still doing my job and people still expected me to do great world-class design. In, um, even beyond that, what I can take with me from Taiwan was the project management and people skills. And the same here, I mean, people expected me to do my design really well but in terms of the whole narrative and and also to to do the ui and everything else that exposed me and and got people to 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 really to find to to uh, to to re to, to kind of find out and realize some of my some of my my skills that haven't been exposed before mm. and and this will feed into to what, what i will do in the future as well which will be much more like narrative and, and story driven. Mm. Yeah. But you nailed that job. <laughs> well, it went, nailed it. No, well, it went, uh, went pretty well. Yeah. yeah. And then that allowed people to see what you could do. And then mm-hmm. you went on to do bigger. Well, yeah. And then I got the opportunity to do, to do the two flagships of 2020 that was just announced. So, yeah, we have two flagships and uh, I got to do both. And it was an amazing opportunity yeah, that's and create cool. a story around that as well. But then that was a little bit different because then all of a sudden you have a lot of people that are having opinions about what you're doing. And that's great. And they're really knowledgeable and, and skillful in all that. But, but it... it it has to be less polarizing and yeah. it has to fit into the overall narrative of what we want to say as a company with focus and everything else. And there's a lot of more pressure, I imagine, once you start going up on yeah. bigger projects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's there's a lot of pressure there. Um, but again, then it's, then, I mean, sometimes I look at it as a scale. Then you just dial it back. You focus on what you're really good at and what you've been doing for 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 so many years and you you get the basics right yeah and then uh, when you have the basics right then you can start looking at the bigger picture and 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 exploring different ideas yeah so the last thing i'm gonna ask okay is i'm sure there's a lot of people out there that want to get in design mm-hmm. and they're going to watch this or listen to this yeah. and you know take a lot away from what you've said and what you've done mm. what experience uh sorry what uh what advice can you give to people I think from from my point of view, exposure is incredibly important. I mean, exposure to different ideas, to different people. So I think, I think also if I would hire someone, I would look at what have you done up until this point, and I would be so critical because unfortunately I would use my my friends and myself as a reference point. And if I would say that if you're not serious about design or whatever you want to do. Um, that's really telling when you're when you're when you're explaining a story. If you haven't been putting all the the hours into it because you love it, then it's harder to excel. It's harder to get to a point where you really feel like ah. So yeah, that would be number one. Like just do it because you love it, but also put down the time and effort. So that would be absolute. And then also expose yourself. I don't expose buy, yourself. <laughs> well, I don't to to ideas, to people, to to all of that. Like like you get that automatically by doing the job and doing the work. But also uh, seek out people. Like seek out people's advice. Like uh, other people that think like you. Now with the internet, just you know, if you like photography, contact other photographers, meet up. Like it's it's there's no excuses these days, and I think that's not number one. There's no excuses. Just there's different ways of doing it. There's no right path, and be ready when opportunity uh, presents itself, so you can really go out there and grab it. It's awesome, man. Yeah. Cheers. Cool. Try to catch me howling at the moon.